there we go. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay, so let me start again. So our speaker today is Dr. Garford. Um, Catherine has a professional expertise in educational psychology and a personal understanding of the frustrations children's and adults with learning disabilities have. As a child, she struggled with reading and spelling herself, so intimately understands what your kids are going through, what the families are going through. Um, Catherine has earned a Bachelor of Education in Elementary Education with a specialization in special ed a master's in special education with a learning disabilities concentration and a PhD in special education with a learning disabilities concentration. But now Catherine focuses her time on helping children, caregivers, parents, and families navigate the educational system, understanding their unique needs, challenges, and strengths, and being an advocate for those families, those kids. And she's also just a fierce champion for all families. And I am very lucky to have met her and know her and very pleased to have her speak to you today. So with that, I will hand it over to Catherine. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to be asked by Dyslexia Canada to be part of this uh, because I think it's a very important thing that we need to do as parents. Unfortunately, uh, what Christine didn't say is I am a parent. I have three children. Two of them are in school and they both have IEPs. So I do have the experience of the parent going into the IEP meetings. And uh, even as someone who's been doing it for years <laughs> professionally, it still can be a little bit overwhelming personally. Um, but that's all right uh, because it's something that I wanted to share only because it is an emotional thing and it's okay if it's difficult for you um because our children are so important to us and we want to do everything we can to help them succeed and ieps are this big mystery to even teachers um and there are lots of things that we can do to help prepare ourselves for the ieps now unfortunately in this presentation we're trying to keep it to an hour and there is a lot of information that I want to cover. So I do have two resources that I've made available to you. And Christine, I believe, will be sharing you um, the links to get them. One of them is a parent's walk through a psych ed. Now, this is a, a video where I take you through the seven components that are commonly found in a psychoeducational assessment and help you understand what information you can get out of each section. The second one is an IEP meeting checklist. Now, these are the things that I think you should do to prepare for your child's IEP meeting because there are things that I do as a parent and also what I do as an advocate when I help my clients. Uh, one of the biggest things is preparing an IEP binder so you have everything that you need in one spot and can refer to it year after year because this is just a one and done thing. These are things that are gonna happen for your child throughout. Now, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will do my best to answer them along the way if they are uh, good for where we're at in the presentation. Otherwise, I will stay after at the end to answer every question there is. I'd also like to extend the invitation for you to join me on a connection call where you can uh, go to my website and sign up for a 15 minute connection call. This isn't a sales call. It's just me trying to figure out if there's a way that I can help you and point you to resources uh, that may help you. I do have a lot of great resources available um, for parents to help understand diagnoses and terms they come across, as well as things that they can do to help their kids. That being said, I am going to um, start sharing my screen. Oh, uh, Christine, you have to make it so I can share my screen, please. Okay. Um, uh, 
Okay, so this presentation is all about finding out what a good IEP looks like. Now, every IEP is going to be, so we'll go back here for a moment. Every IEP is gonna be different because every child and their needs are different. And so I don't want you to look at other people's IEPs and expect them to be the same. Unfortunately, most of the province do take this approach where they have a standard set of strategies and objectives that they typically just cut and paste and throw into IEPs. And I understand why they do it, but it's not really helping our children. The first thing that I'm going to do in this presentation is go through some of the basics that I want to make sure that you have an understanding of before I take you through some case studies where I'll show you actual images from IEPs and talk about what they're saying for the, the goal and the objectives. And then I will talk about what I think would be more appropriate given the student it was for. So I want to start about the four principles of instructions. I'm sorry, the formatting's a little bit off for that. Um, but the first note is that students must have, or sorry, must actively participate in the learning that took place. So this is um, a principle where we want the kids to be actively engaged in everything that they're doing in the classroom. When we're talking about students with specific learning disabilities, this is usually something that's fairly easy to go accomplish because they are able to comprehend what's happening in the classroom. Where it gets difficult for uh, individuals with learning disabilities is if they're not reading at grade level or they're not able to complete the assignments at grade level. Uh, then we need to look at how we can make it so they are still able to actively participate in the learning. Uh, we need to realize that students learn in a variety of different ways and they learn concepts at different rates. Learning is a process that can happen for an individual and a group. So the reason why I reviewed these is because you're going to see me trying to pull them into the goals and the objectives and the strategies that I'm talking about. Uh, there we go. Now, for IEPs, there are accommodations and modifications. It's really important that you understand the difference between these two because they have very different implications. So an accommodation is something that we're doing to help the student learn or show their learning. This isn't changing anything that they are expected to learn and they're on the same curricular path as their peers. That time that we switch it over to a modification or include modifications, those are changes that are made to the student's educational plan or the curriculum that they're following. So it's different. Uh, they should still be related to the outcomes that their peers are working towards in class, but it may be at a lower or a higher level. Now, modifications make it so that your child, if they're still receiving a modification by the time that they reach high school in grade 11 and 12, in as far as I know, all of the provinces, if they are still on a modified program at that point, uh, then they don't have the opportunity to graduate with a full uh, diploma. They just receive a certificate of completion, and this has implications for their learning. But that does not mean that you should not modify a student's um, program in if they need it. The example I like to use, because I know it well, is myself. So I am severely dyslexic. I could not read at grade level and I could not perform math at grade level when I was in elementary school. Um, and so I had to go on a modified program because I wasn't able to keep up with my peers. And then I actually went to schools that specialized in dyslexia. I was able to catch up and then move off the modification. The reason why I mentioned this is if your child is in a lower grade 
and they are you're humming and hawing as to whether you should modify their academic program realize that it doesn't have to be permanent and if you are modifying the program you want to create a plan to get them back to the full program that their peers are on you can modify one subject or the whole program with our students with specific learning disorders like uh, dyscalculia dyslexia dysgraphia it may just mean modifying a subject that they are uh, week in and having the rest at their age or their uh, grade level, which is fine. Um, but make sure you have a plan so that the classroom teacher knows and the school knows that you're expecting them to reach where their uh, peers are in a certain amount of time. Now, some schools um, will do this by or not modify the program and avoid modifying the program by providing them with um, supports and assistive technology to remove the barrier. So um, another, I, I think Christine forwarded a question about a student not having IEP goals and uh, this teacher or the school saying it was okay because all they had was accommodations. Well, if they're having accommodations such as using audiobooks or the use of a calculator, which are completely valid accommodations and recommended in certain situations, but we should still have goals in the IEP to make sure that they are still working on those skills because even though they struggle in this area and we want to support them when they're doing work with their peers at that level. So for example, say you have a student in the, you know, in high school who's still reading in an elementary school grade level, like a grade four or grade five. So they can't read the text that they're expected for English class, but they can understand it if they get an audiobook. Well, that's great. But we still want to make sure that the school is providing them instructional and support to improve their reading because reading is you know, a basic human right. And the same goes for mathematics. Yes, they may have a calculator, but we still want to make sure that we have the support in place to help them increase their abilities in the areas that they are weak in. Let's go to the next one. So when it comes to IEP goals and objectives uh, in the report, I like to think about asking myself, when I read them, are they acting how or act how? What's the action in the goal? In what context is it being applied? What terms are being used? So what am I expecting the student to do? So for example, let's say um, Sam is working on their multiplication tables in pull out resource time so that they can increase their math fact knowledge of the one to 12 times tables. And then you list how this is happening and what your terms are. So these are the steps that we're hoping to reach to improve these skills. Next, I'm sure you're familiar with SMART goals. They are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. What I'm saying here is I don't want the airy fairy goals that I am seeing in a lot of the IEPs that I'm reading through. They're very broad and they don't give teachers a lot of direction in how they're actually supposed to help support your child. And that doesn't help your child and it doesn't help the teacher in the classroom. When I work on IEPs, goals and objectives, I want the teacher to be able to read the IEP and know exactly what they're supposed to do instead of seeing a list of best practices that they're aware of and they know are what they should do in the classroom, but it doesn't help them tailor it to your child's specific needs. 
So let's take a look at a couple case studies. This first one is a grade three student with a specific learning disorder uh, in reading and writing, and she also has ADHD. So this, I took a screenshot, and so this is an actual screenshot from their IEP, and um, where the province that this is in, they have the categories that they're going to do it, uh, have the goals for. So the goal is that I can present information and ideas to an audience I may not know. To me, that's very, very broad and generic and it looks just like the goals or the um, learning outcomes that the rest of the class receives. The objective is that I can present information clearly and in an organized way with confidence. So the strategies are for the teacher to provide context for the learning so that the child knows why it's relevant. Well, that's something that they should be doing with all students in the classroom. And that's not specifically gonna support this child in the long run, uh, any differently than it would everyone in the classroom. Top background knowledge. So that's having the teacher refresh or provide context to the situation, which we read right above, and just bring in the information that this student should have ready to tap on when they're talking about the subject. Now they want to embed in strategy instruction to the curriculum where possible. I'd like to know what strategies they're talking about for this student uh, because we're talking about speaking and presentation skills. So what type of strategies are they saying that are specifically going to address this student's needs? Remember, they have a specific learning disorder in reading and writing. So just saying cue cards, that's not going to be very effective or helpful for this student. Uh, limit the number of new facts, words, or concepts at a time that yeah, that's understandable, but I don't know how that's going to be helping her, the student present information and ideas to an audience that they may not know. Um, then we're talking about providing choice when possible. So that's giving them the opportunity to select the topic that they talk about. But again, these are things that we're seeing that all the students should have access to provide models and examples, use graphic organizers where possible, set priorities, reduce the workload and expectations, uh, set small deadlines and timelines when possible. So here we're trying to help the student with their executive functions and planning skills, which taps into the ADHD, but also in the learning disability area, which is somewhat appropriate, but again, it's not really telling the teacher what exactly this student should be working on and how they can support the student. Um, so we're going to set goals, make and monitor, adjust plans, self-assessing with opportunities to practice and extra time. This isn't telling me what I'm supposed to do to help this student with these communications. So I'm just going to see there's a question. Um, let me just read. So one of you has a daughter who has ADD, dyslexia, and developmental coordination disorder. And because she isn't violent and is a ha she doesn't get help. Yes. So one of the issues uh, that I do find in a lot of the schools is if it's not a squeaky wheel um it's not getting your child's not gonna get the support that they need unless you're really really pushing for it but i think that's one that i'm going to address um more at the end so we can focus on this student so i created a bunch of goals and objectives that i would like to see for this student that i feel give the teacher a better idea about what they're supposed to do to help support this student. So I can present information clearly in an organized way. Well, that's taking pieces from what they had and I'm making it very specific. So this is something that we want this 
a student to be able to do. Now, I'm gonna tell you how exactly I want this student to do it. I want her to be able to take notes about a topic that she wants to speak about. They want, I want her to be able to organize her notes so that she can communicate what she's saying. So she's not jumping from page to page from idea to idea. It's connected and it has a logical flow to it. I want the student to be able to create note cards with a meaningful representation of what they want to say. Remember, the student has a specific learning disorder in reading and writing. So writing in clear sentences and the actual act of writing can be very difficult, right? And if you're struggling to read what you're writing, then it's having a cue card or a note card is just as stressful as not having them. So we want to make sure that the student is able, able to have the concepts that they want to show, whether that's images uh, or pictures. There's no reason why note cards have to just have words on them. We want to give the student an opportunity to practice presenting the cards to themselves. And then slowly build up the number of people that they're presenting to to build that comfort because when you're being asked to present on anything it can be intimidating and it's easier to start for most people in a small group with people that you trust and then slowly build your confidence so I go further into how they can take notes strategies. So we need to look at teaching them how to rephrase the information that they want to take notes on and use, the, sorry, we want to give them the strategies for note taking. So making it so they can take out the words that are superfluous or too many words just focus on the key concepts and phrases so that when they look at the cue card, the note is going to trigger the ideas and concepts that they want to use instead of having a whole bunch of words that are too much. So if I talk about, say I'm doing a presentation on vehicles, and instead of writing all the different types of vehicles, I just write um auto bus truck or even just types and i have little pictures of a car a truck a bus and a semi truck that can trigger the information and my understanding of what i can say about these things in the presentation we're talking about how to organize them so she can um clearly present what she's talking about well, we did see graphic organizers on the school's um, strategies, but I want to make sure that we're talking about specific graphic organizers that this student has been presented or um, instructed on and is comfortable with. Graphic organizers come in many shapes and forms, and it's important to realize that some of the graphic organizers actually make it more difficult for students with a specific learning disorder than making it easier. So it could be testing them in an area that they struggle with and making it that much more difficult for them to understand what they're going through. Um, one of the things that I, I like really recommending to families is the concept of visual note taking and creating legends and acronyms and things that they can use to quickly represent concepts. There is something called working memory, which students with specific learning disorders often struggle with. This is a term that you can find in your child's psychoeducational assessment and if it's lower below average it means it's difficult for them to hold um a, a, several pieces of information in their head at one time while they're trying to use it so anytime that they're copying things down or reading things it's going to have an impact on what they can do especially if they're being asked to read words that they can't read with any automaticity so if they're looking at their note card and they're having to sound out what the word says, all the effort that they're putting into sounding out 
what the word is, takes away from their ability to focus on what they really want to say. Another strategy that I like to include is giving the student the opportunity to record themselves um, when they're doing presentations so they, they can watch themselves present, even though it's uncomfortable and it's always weird hearing your own voice on recording, but it allows them to be able to make uh, judgments on how they can improve and getting the opportunity to watch themselves and self-correct in future presentations. Uh, and this goes into more strategies for presenting to, you know, some of the um, strategies I mentioned before. Now, the next student I want to talk about is a grade six student who has a specific learning disorder and ADHD. Again, those are commonly comorbid conditions. So that means that there are several students that have dyslexia or another specific learning disorder. Um, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and that's fine. So this is a personal awareness core competency goal, and it's talking about um, that they can persevere during challenging tasks, and they have two objectives. They want to know themselves as a learner and to advocate for their needs. Um, and this, the, Second objective about advocating for the student's needs is one that I see all the time in IEPs and it's an important skill for students to learn when they're ready. But when our students or when our children are in elementary school grades, especially if it's, you know, the, you know, two, three, four, this is when they're very, um, typically new to their diagnosis, so they're not too confident with it and they don't wanna be seen different as their peers. They're still accepting the diagnosis and they would rather say, stay silent and struggle uh, than call attention to themselves because that makes them different and stand out. I find this is especially the case with girls. And um, as a parent, <laughs> I know that like, oh yeah, well, all they have to do, you know, is to ask for help. And I'm like, well, I can tell you for a fact that my child isn't gonna raise their hand to say, hey, I need help, I don't understand the instructions or I can't read the instructions. That's not something that they're gonna do. They'd rather sit there and pretend to work than have everybody in the class realize that they need help. Um, so let's go and see the goals and the accommodation, or sorry, the goals and objectives that I came up with. Now I broke this down into several. So the first goal that I want the student to learn is how to refocus when they feel distracted. This is common for all students and all of us really is knowing how to identify a situation where you are being distracted and find ways to help yourself return to the activity at hand. So I want the student to learn, to figure out when their mind's watering and needs a break. And we wanna give them strategies that they can use to refocus. So I always want to make sure that the responsibility isn't just on the student. We need teachers and educational assistants in the classroom to help the student realize that the situation is happening. They are still young and figuring out what's going on and may not even realize that they're distracted because they're too much in the distraction. So we can develop discrete signals. We can get them to do check-ins on a task. Some students, you know, they have a, a clock or they look at the clock and every five minutes they check in. And we want to come up with a list of ideas of what happens when they're losing focus. So this is a way that we can help the teacher understand the student and the student understand themselves. So that's building the self-awareness. And it could be when I'm, you know, getting at the end of my attention span, I start fidgeting or picking at things, tapping. When I'm doing that, I should try this. 
And again, you can't just take five strategies from anywhere to help students refocus. We need to figure out what works for these students and these individuals, because what works for me isn't going to work for you. Some kids having a fidget toy, going for the water fountain, it's all making sure that these are happening. We need to have it so the teacher is aware of these strategies so they can help the student employ these strategies. Now, I realize with older students, this is more difficult because as you know, when you don't have that homeroom classroom that you're spending the majority time with your teacher, it's harder to get all teachers on, to, on board for these intervention programs, especially when we're working with students that don't have the same um, outward expressions of the distractions. Now, the next goal is the student will learn to check their understanding of assignments during seat work. This is crucial because we'll have students that are sitting there pretending to work or not working, trying to keep themselves busy because they don't really understand the assignment. Again, this is one that I see often with students that struggle with working memory because the teacher will give them a set of instructions for what they're expected to do in the assignment, but then they'll talk a little bit more. And by the time the students are expected to do their assignment, they have forgotten what it's about and they may not have the skills or the resources to know what to do. So some of the things that I think are good objectives would be developing a checklist to ask themselves what I need to do, develop strategies when reading through the assignment and going through how to identify how exactly they're supposed to answer the question. So let's go through this in a little bit more detail. So when we're getting the student to develop a checklist of questions to ask themselves, I actually recommend having a physical checklist, like print it off on the computer, laminate it, get it so they can refer to it. I know, you know, you can put it on um, assistive technology or if they do it enough times they have it, but it's always good to have that hard copy to refer to. And if it's something that they do in class after class and it becomes more of a habit for them, then we're gonna have more success. Um, I will talk about the slides in a little bit. So, oops, sorry, I need to close that. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get to, so I can see my slides. Question and answer. There we go. Sorry about that. Zoom puts everything on top of each other. All right. So the, um, this is what we're gonna get the student to do to learn how to go through the assignment and get the information out for themselves. One of the ways that we can do this is getting them to read it if that's a skill that they have. If they don't, I highly recommend getting um, some sort of assistive technology that you can put Speechify on. Speechify is a freely available app that you can use with a phone, or an iPad or a tablet of some sort, you take a picture of the printed text and it will, autom it will change it and automatically read it to you. The free version has a limited number of voices. If you get the paid version, Gwyneth Paltrow will read it to you if you, if you select your voice. Uh, the one thing I really like about Speechify is you can do it in different languages. So if your child is still taking a second language or is in French immersion, uh, they can get it read to them in that language with the appropriate accenting. So they can take a picture, get it read to them so they can hear what it says and figure out what they're asking. Now, as the students get older, you're going to have similar types of assignments for classes. So in social studies, you'll have a textbook, you'll read the textbook, and then you'll have questions where you're having to basically find the answer in the text. So we want them to give them strategies to know, okay, so for this question, I'm going to have to go back and read the text or whatever I was asked to read, 
and find what they're talking about. Or I'm gonna have to answer, what does this word mean? So I have to do a, like a vocabulary definition. And then, so I'm gonna either look in the index, sorry, look in the glossary, or I'm gonna have to come up with my own definition. Now in textbooks, when they introduce a new term, it's usually bold. So maybe if I go back and I flip through the text or the, the assigned pages that the questions are coming from, I might be able to find this word in bold. And that's a good place for me to try and find the, uh, the definition of this word. So I could rephrase it and put it in my own words and put it in the assignment. Now there's also the type of questions that are gonna ask me to go deeper. So it's not something that I'm just gonna have to look to the book, I'm going to have to think about it and give my opinion or what I feel about the situation. So we need to give them these tips and tricks and teach them the words to be looking for so that they can use those to answer. These are not skills that our students are going to learn on the, their own. These are skills that are going to need explicit teaching. So I'm going to say, okay, this is the type of question that you just need to look for a textbook. And you know, when you're starting out, you can even color code them. So if you're working with your child on their homework after school, get a pencil crown or get post-it notes or something and just put a little sticky and say, okay, this is one that you just need to look, at, uh, look and find it in the text. This is one that's a vocabulary definition. This is one that you're gonna have to think about. Um, and if it's something that they can highlight, uh, whether it's on an e-reader or paper, you know, come up with uh, a code to highlighting. So I know when I'm reading, if it's um, just information, I highlight in yellow. If it's a definition, I highlight it in pink. And if it's like a theory or something that's that's formatted in the sequence matters i highlight it in orange so giving them these strategies and teach them that you can highlight the questions and underline the questions so that you know the important parts this is allowed and don't feel bad if you're doing it um let's go to the next one uh Ah, this is another one that's really important, especially as students get older and time becomes an issue. There are questions that can be answered in one or two words. There are questions that can be answered in a sentence or two, and there are questions that require long answers. You may have to point out to your child that, okay, you know what? This is a question that only requires a couple words. This is one that you're gonna have to do a paragraph and this is one that's several paragraphs. These are strategies that you can use at home, but also have it so the school has responsibilities for this. One way that the teacher can do this is make sure that they are putting the number of marks the question is worth in brackets beside the questions, especially on tests and quizzes. Then that they can understand the amount of effort they need to put into the assignment. Um, so that's the end of my slides, but I do have other things that I do wanna talk about. So I'm gonna stop this and then you can see me. Um, so when it comes to your goals, and objectives in your IEP, make sure that the teacher can look at them and know what they're supposed to do. One thing that I've come across in IEP meetings is the school being very hesitant to add additional goals and objectives to what they present you with, especially when you're working on or in the lower grades, you know, they'll say, well, once the student comes and becomes part of the meeting, we don't want them to feel overwhelmed. And then but the question is, well, we're trying to individualize their education plan and make sure that they're getting what they need. And we need to include enough goals to make sure that their uh, learning needs are being met. Now we realize there, there's only a finite amount of goals and objectives that are realistic to expect 
the teachers to address, but it all depends on the area. The other thing that I have often heard is, well, that's what the other kids are working on, so we don't need to include it as an objective. And I don't like hearing that because a lot of the goals and objectives and the cut and paste ones that you get are actually ones that are in the learning outcomes for the year for the rest of the students in the class. We want goals and objectives to address the child's specific needs. When we're working with kids that have issues with letter formation and number formation, even if they're in the early grades, we want to make sure that there is a goal about the letter and the number formation and the fluency or how quickly they can do it. We want it to be so it's automatic and they don't have to think about it. A lot of our kids with dyslexia and dysgraphia, they're in the year earlier years, they're really putting a lot of effort and even in the older years if they're not getting the interventions that they need to just remember what the letter looks like and how to form the letter. This again is very very taxing for them. We want to get them to a place where they no longer have this. I see schools putting them in assistive technology using, you know, Dragon Naturally Speaking or various dictation softwares and that's great for assignments and tasks while they are in class having to do an assignment, but it is still important for them to learn how to do this and to do it fluently. So they don't have to think about how to form the letter as they go. We also wanna make sure that they're forming it properly. So that means top down and mirrors would be left, right. I think I did that right in your perspective, but not mine. So, we want to make sure that they're getting the best um, use of their time. So this can be automatic because a lot of the assistive technology is very expensive. And unfortunately, once they're out of school, they're not guaranteed to have it. So unless you're in a situation where you can make sure they have the up-to-date technology and all the apps that they need to succeed, the school isn't doing their job because they're like, okay, we'll get you to grade 12. You have the equipment that you need, but then you graduated, you know, have fun. So we want to make sure that they get the skills for this. Uh, another um, one that I see or that I definitely like making sure is put in IEPs, especially for students that are reading below goal, grade level, that they can understand grade level or higher. This is classic for dyslexic students. And that is making sure if there's any silent reading time or deer, drop dead and read, or is that what they call it? Uh, drop everything and read, sorry. That's what it is. Um, you wanna make sure that they have access to audiobooks because in during silent reading, your child is not improving if they don't know how to do it. So if they are struggling and decoding all of the words, they don't have the skills to be silent reading and they're missing out on so much. We want them to have access to audiobooks. Now the school has access to these um, and even your local library. So is it something that you wanna do at home? Uh, a lot of the public libraries in Canada have access to the Libby app. And with your public library free membership, you can get this app on your phone. There are so many books and classics on there. Now, I would really encourage you to make your child, or not make your child, but get your child to listen to these, listen to the car. Because the thing is, when you are not reading at grade level, you are not reading as much as the um, good readers in your classroom. And you're also, they're not getting the same vocabulary exposure. Our speech and, you know, things that we see uh, in movies, it's not the same as formal written language. So we wanna make sure that they are getting the exposure that they need to the language. I'm looking at the time. So I'm gonna make sure that I try and get to these questions. Um, okay. So let me check on them. So 
So you're wondering what section of the IEP are these types of goals? So if I go back to the slide, it all depends where you live uh, on how things are set up formally for your assessments. So if I go back to, um, hold on. Uh, let me just share my screen. So if we look here, so this is a goal from a British Columbian IEP. And so this is how they have it listed. So I would have the goals that I wrote go here, the objectives here, and the strategies and the bullet points go here. Um, it all depends on the district and where you live, how they are set up, but it, it's same information being presented in different ways. Um, when an IEP is agreed upon by the parents and the administration of the school, is it kind of like a contract or just aspirational? Again, that depends on where you live. Um, some places it's aspirational and, you know, they're very, very wishy-washy and they don't like putting in things that are specific and things that you're expecting them to measure in the IEP because they don't want to commit themselves to doing that. In other places it is. So, um, attendee, again, if you want to either send me a question on, um, uh, through my email which is info at garforthseducation.com and let me know what province you are in or territory, I can give you more information, but it depends on where you live as to what the answer would be. Uh, can I let parents know that they need to have audiobooks on their high school, high, right, yes. So it is true that you do need to have audiobooks on as an accommodation for your child before they go to high school. This is also something that you want to request if you're getting a new psychoeducational assessment done, have it so that the school psychologist writes it in the report, try and get everything, everything possible listed in your psych ed as an accommodation. Now, having a million accommodations on your child's IEP isn't necessarily a good thing uh, because you don't want to have too many strategies that don't work. It's about finding the ones that are best supporting your child so that they can succeed and um, knowing that there is such thing as too much. And just because, you know, so-and-so does it, um, doesn't mean it's going to be right for your child. I know of several situations where I can think of um, for myself in grade 10, um, my social studies teacher was dyslexic. He's like, I'm dyslexic. I know exactly what you need. This is what you need to do. This is how you need to do it. It's how I got through school. It's going to work for you. Well, um, it wasn't exactly what I needed. It actually tested areas that I was weak in and made it worse. So it did not help. Um, so make sure you take time when you're trying accommodations. If you find one that works, great. Don't be afraid to add different ones. And even things like audiobooks. I know for me personally, I love listening to audiobooks. They're great. But if I'm having to read something academic and I have to learn it, an audiobook or listening to it does not work for my comprehension. I have to physically read it. I have to physically take notes by hand. So you know, using a computer, typing notes 
in the classroom, yeah, that works a lot for great for some people, but others it doesn't work. So just because it sounds like it's a great idea, you have to see if it's actually working. Um, let's see. Catherine, the question that we get um, yeah. quite often mm -hmm. is whether an IEP can be changed or amended. Something that may have worked in grade two, if it's not working anymore, what do you do? IEPs are supposed to be living documents that are addressed every year, academic year. You should be getting reports with your child's report card on the IEP for any modifications and goals the saying the progress that they are making towards them. You should have an annual meeting at least annually to discuss change and adapt because your child is growing and changing as they progress through school. Uh, their needs are going to change and how to support them is going to change as well. Nothing in an IEP is fixed. It is a living document that goes with your child. And I highly recommend getting anything like if you've tried something make sure it is written there so you can reference it in the future, especially when it comes to transitions between schools. The other thing that I should mention is that if your child is transitioning from you know, primary school to intermediate, um, into middle school, into high school, out of high school, you are entitled to a transition meeting. Transitioning should not happen at the same time as an IEP meeting. It is something completely separate. And while you can have goals and objectives to help with the transition in the IEP, it should not be discussed during the IEP meeting. Um, can someone just be dyslexic without even evaluating him? I've had people assume my child must have ADHD as well. Any advice? Yes, you can be a dyslexic. Will the school believe that you are dyslexic? Will they do anything for you being dyslexic? No. Unfortunately, hopefully it'll change, but no, you need a formal psychoeducational assessment giving you the diagnosis of a specific learning disorder. It has to be a specific learning disorder in reading, writing, or mathematics for the schools to take it in Canada because that's what the DSM uh, defines it. Terms like dyslexia, dyscalculia are not formal diagnostic terms recognized by the American Psychological Association. So while they can be used, there's not a universe or not a North American agreed upon definition. Um, so while there, someone could very easily screen him for dyslexia, identify him as being dyslexic without doing a full psychoeducational assessment, that is not something the school is gonna accept. So I am sorry, uh, I'm trying to change that, but we haven't got there yet, hopefully soon. Um, so there are several, uh, another favorite topic of mine is executive functions. And um, so if you're talking about your child, you think they might be just dyslexic or is it dyslexia, ADHD? The problem is, or not the problem, the fact is if you have a neurodiversity, so if your brain is a little bit different, there is a delay in the development of executive functions. Executive functions are the skills that help you with planning, organization, learning. These skills are also associated with ADHD. So it's finding a way to tease everything out as to what's causing what. And sorry, just give me a second. When it comes to ADD, uh, and your child has a learning disability, there are a lot of things that they do to try to hide or mask um, or cope with their learning disability that can seem, so you're saying ADHD, so I'm, I'm assuming that's inattentive or ADHD inattentive presentation. So they're distractible, they're not wanting to do things. Well, if I can't do what's being asked of me and it's too hard, I would rather not. So I'm not gonna focus. I'm gonna be off task. I'm gonna be wandering around the room. I'm gonna do anything I can to avoid it. So if, but if it's only happening in the school situation during tasks that are too difficult for them, well, it's not that they have ADD. It's that 
they have a specific learning disorder or dyslexia, dysgraphia, whatever, and they can't do the task, so they're avoiding it. All right. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different great free resources for audiobooks. Um, I highly recommend them. They're great. We listen to them in our house on road trips or when we're driving the kids around. Um, it, it's really good. Uh, let me see. Any? Yeah. One of the things I do want to mention um, to everyone is that uh, Catherine provided an amazing webinar um, for us a couple months ago on getting ready for your IEP meeting, which I would highly recommend everyone go and take a look at that program as well. It is on our website, the, the recording, because, you know, you've got all of these great, these great comments and examples of how we can get into that IEP. But it does mean you have to go into those meetings prepared. Yes. And there's a lot of preparation that happens. And that webinar does go through what you can do to prepare. So I just wanted to put that out there to everyone that, you know, there's a lot of work on your end as a parent, as a caregiver that has to go into this before you go into the IEP meeting. That said, they can be extremely stressful and intimidating meetings. So if you do need help, in preparing, please make sure you reach out to, you know, someone like Dr. Garford, who is there to help you do that, or even to other parents that have gone through it and been through it, but reach out and talk to people to help get ready for this meeting. And you are allowed to bring in a support person with you during the IEP meeting, to be there, to take notes for you. Don't make it too hard on yourself. It's going to be an emotional situation because you are being faced with the fact that your child is different and they're not doing or reaching the expectations of their peers. And you can go through a hundred IEP meetings, um, but it's still difficult, right? It's still your baby that's not getting what they need to succeed. Mm -hmm. And it hurts. Um, Another thing that I'd say, as well as the IEP stuff, you really need to take the time to understand your child's psychoeducational assessment. I know it is a very intimidating document that is full of jargon and information that just seems like it's too much. And there are several parents that just skim to the bottom and look for their recommendations um, and conclusions. And while that is a very good part of the psychoeducational assessment, there's so much more that you can get from it that can help you understand your child and their needs. The two things that are often seem to be ignored by parents, uh, by teachers that have a big impact on your child's success, again, is the working memory and the processing speed. So whether, regardless of whether it's high or low, it's gonna have different implications for your child. There, uh, so processing speed is the number or the amount of time that it takes you to understand the information that's being presented to you. So if you have a high processing speed and your teacher is telling you the same thing over and over again, but slower and slower, you are going to get infuriated. You're like, yeah, I heard you the first time. I know what you said. I don't understand it. Saying it slower is not going to make it any better for me, right? Um, but then if they have slower processing speed, it's also making sure that you do stuff like preparing them in advance, pre-teaching stuff, really making sure that the teacher takes the time to activate that background knowledge so that what they know that is gonna be talking about, making sure that your child gets the opportunity to have um, insight into what's gonna be happening next day in class. So instead of reading the chapter in the textbook, the, after they have the lesson, they read it before. So they can get the terminology and the knowledge beforehand and use it in the lesson. So they'll get more out of the lesson. Uh, and again, working memory, it's the amount of space that you have in your brain to hold information while you're using it. This is gonna have impacts everywhere with everything that you do. And know that in situations of stress or anxiety, even if you have really high working memory and processing speed that it goes down. 
<laughs> so um, school situations when you're struggling, even if you're good everywhere else, it's a stressful situation that puts you in an uncomfortable place and you're not going to do as well as you could. Thank you. Just looking at the time, we are a couple minutes over, so I, I don't want to take up more of your time. Um, Catherine, I, I thank I you. See for... one more question. Oh, is there one more? Yeah, um, is oh, going asking about transition meeting from high school to college. Yes. So if you are if you have a child that is transitioning to high school, like post secondary institution of whatever variety, you can schedule and even if they're not going to post secondary life after high school, you can request a transition meeting to how to help support your child get ready for that transition. It is a huge transition, right? Going from the protected small fish, or sorry, big fish in a small pond of high school, being you know, the top of the class, you know, the big kids at school into the real world where who cares? Well, not who cares, but um it's not the same protection right it's the same thing of going from elementary to middle school so you can request transition or you should be having you shouldn't have to request them you should be having transition meetings you can also go to the post-secondary institution that your child is going to attend whether it's trades university college whatever they have centers for access uh, access and diversity learning resource centers they all have different names, but it's the same sort of thing. You can go before your child starts school to get everything set up in advance so they don't sink right when they begin. Um, and, you know, make sure you have the executive functioning support. Be that parent that makes sure, yeah, you know, are you, you're doing this, try and get copies of their um, course outline so that you can remind them they have an exam on a certain day instead of walking into an exam and not realizing you have one that day and oh maybe I should have stood ready for that but that never happens <laughs> right if you have time there's one more uh, yeah <laughs> how early do you start for transitioning planning I would start a couple grades before it happens especially when you're transitioning out of high school you want to make sure that your child is willing to advocate and able to advocate for yourself. Um, there's a blog post series that I have on my website. I think it's five or six posts that talk about um, features of a common successful dyslexic. It's a research article that was published in the early 2000s, I think, maybe the late 90s. And it identified six things that are common elements of individuals who are successful with a specific learning disorder or ADHD or that sort of things. And everything that you can do to help prepare yourself for this in advance is great. I mean, the sooner you can getting them to start advocate, self-advocating and understanding what they need and that self-discovery process is hugely important, right? Encouraging them to attend the IEP meetings with you when they are ready, right? Um, don't worry about it in those, you know, early elementary years, you know, grade six or grade seven, maybe start pushing it a little more. But if your child hasn't accepted their diagnosis, you're going to do more damage than good forcing them to attend the IEP meeting. There is some tough love that has to happen with some kids about accepting their diagnosis, but you don't want to inflict more trauma into their education because it's lifelong right? Just because high school's over doesn't mean the trauma that happened during your school years is gone. And it's lasting, right? So make sure you can do everything as in a positive way as you can. There are great resources out there talking to other people. There's amazing documentaries out there that, you know, sometimes it helps seeing someone that's gone through the situation or is going through it. Right, and saying, oh, so it's not just me. Hmm. Uh, there are peer advocates. A lot of the universities and colleges have um, programs to help kids get adapted and, uh, you know, learn note taking strategies. Um, and the more you can do to help support your child, 
now, the better, the more you can help them understand their diagnosis, the better. Um, and it's, it's a long haul. It's difficult, but it's worth it. Thank you. So we're now sitting at uh, 9, 10, well, Eastern time, my time. So I'm going to have to stop the questions now, but I want to say just a great big thank you, Catherine, for providing your time again um, yes. to give this information out. Like I said at the very beginning, it's one of the top questions we get asked is about IEPs and what should a good one look like and does mine look okay? And you've provided some really great examples that I think um, will be very useful to a lot of parents. So we will be uh, providing all of you with the, the recording, the slides. I'll reattach all of the links to an email. So if you didn't have a chance to capture them in the, in the chat right now, I will send those links again. Um, I just wanted to know as well, there is a link there um, uh, to reach Dr. Garforth. And she does, as she said, she does offer um, an initial uh, complimentary consultation. I would highly recommend if you're really struggling, if you don't know where to start, if you don't know where to go and what to look for, reach out to her. Um, or if you're looking just for some quick informal uh, help, support a shoulder to, to cry in, feel free to reach out to Dyslexia Canada. I am a mom um, as well of a child with dyslexia. I've been there, I've done it. And I've got a whole network of parents behind me that have been there, done that. So please feel free, reach out to the networks, reach out to the, the professionals. Um, the, there's a the growing the community out there to help. Yeah, I mean, the Facebook groups are really good. You can post anonymously in them. Um, I have the Ultimate Parent Advocacy Group where people can ask questions. I'm in it regularly. It's just trying to make sure that you guys have the success um, and someone to be there in your, in your corner. Right, it's it's hard when you feel alone, but then you go to the playground and you know, talk to some other parents and realize, oh, it's not <laughs> uncommon. Oh, your kid has an IEP too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, with that, again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. And I I apologize for the slip up with my slides at the very beginning, but please go to dyslexiacanada.org, check out the the events, the Polar Pursuit. A virtual hunt that we've got going on. Um, check out the other resources we have, the other webinars, the information, pamphlets, things like that. And I look forward to seeing everyone at our next webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>